Acts chapter 6 this morning. Uh, throughout the Bible, we have different characters that we will come in contact with. Some of these characters are positive and leave us a positive example, and some are negative and leave us a negative example. If I were to mention two men, uh, one by the name of Abel and one by the name of Cain, we would find them in the very early pages of the Bible. And if you know anything about the Bible, and even if you know very little, you would know that Cain would be a negative example in the murder of his brother. And Abel, the positive, as he followed God. But throughout the Bible, the Bible is full of men and women who have followed God or rejected God. As we come to Acts chapter 6, we're going to learn about another character in the history of Christianity. And this man's name is Stephen. We find him just in a few portions of Scripture, Acts chapter 6 and a little bit in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, when will Lord willing be there next Sunday, we will learn about the message that he preaches and then after that his martyrdom. Stephen is known as the first martyr or the first recorded martyr in the book of Acts. And a man who had just a, a story that is unlike many, who God called uniquely to follow him by giving his life for the sake of the gospel. God does not call everyone to give their life for the gospel physically. But he calls all of us to give ourselves for the gospel. In fact, Jesus Christ said that no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. God is not looking for half wits. And I don't mean mentally, I mean spiritually. And yet there are churches that are full of half Christians, or if I can, half wits, who have not completely follow the Lord. Now, there are a number of reasons for this, which I could spend the next 40 years of my ministry talking about all the reasons. But the reasons don't really matter now, do they? We could talk about our upbringing and how if I had been in that home or in that church or had that experience, then I could really follow God. We could talk about our list of positive or negative traits that we think we are cursed with or blessed with. And if I had those talents that that person has or those, uh, those finances, then I could sell out for Jesus Christ. We could call, talk about our calling. If I had their job, boy, if I was paid to be at church every day, then I would be sold out for Jesus Christ. But because I'm not, well, then you see, I can't be all in for Jesus Christ. And my friend, the Bible does not discriminate based upon our talents, based upon our upbringings, based upon our callings. The Bible calls all of us to be all in for Jesus Christ. God is looking for those who will be surrendered completely to him. And as we look at the account of Stephen, we're going to notice some commendable characteristics some things we ought to take note of. We're going to notice that others will have noticed who Stephen was and what Stephen was like. You never notice that in the Christian, the Christian world, that typically when someone says, don't judge me, they are typically saying that in regards to an area that is against God. You ever notice, make that observation? They will bring some outlandish conversation like, you know, listen, don't judge me as I fill in the known sin. Don't judge me as I murder my neighbors. Don't judge me as I speak this kind of language. Don't judge me as I... And, and they often use this particular phrase when they just want to live a guilt-free life. Yet, we'll find here in Acts chapter 6 that the Bible is very clear that we, though we live for God, we live in front of others. Jesus leans into this in, in the parable, I'm sorry, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he talks about our light and our salt, that is living in front of others. 
And Jesus commands us to let our light so shine that others may see it. All right, that does not seem to be a secret Christianity, does it? Let your light so shine that others may see it and glorify your Father. And so though we live for God, we do live in front of others. We're going to find out in this chapter that Stephen had an exemplary testimony. He had some good character. But what we'll discover in this chapter that God used Stephen in a powerful, amazing way. What I want to challenge with us with us this morning is that God wants to use us just as powerfully and just as uniquely. We may not have the same unique calling that Stephen will have, but it is no less of a calling in your life and in my life. God wants to use you and God wants to use me, not because we're lovely, not because we're talented, but because God wants to use us and he will use us when we are surrendered to him. Surrender is not being half in. Surrender is being all in for Jesus Christ. So let's this morning ask the Lord's help and then we'll begin to unpack Acts chapter 6 with God's help. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for the time that we have this morning to open up your word. And Lord, I pray that you would guide uh, this time, this portion of the service. Lord, as I speak, help me to articulate clearly the truths from your word. Lord, your spirit must, must work in us. Lord, I'm asking that you would keep this time free from distractions and that nothing would hinder your word from touching us. And Lord, I ask you to help us to respond to it this morning. That if there is an area or areas that we are not given over to you or not sold out to you in, that we would today surrender to you. And Lord, we know that if we do that, you will use us. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory. And if someone's here this morning has never trusted Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that today they would do that. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Now, Acts chapter 6 begins in kind of a unique way. Acts chapter 6 is going to begin with a problem in the church. Now, we've had some problems. Acts chapter 5, we had some deceit in the church. But this is a different type problem, a problem that still plagues every single church and can still affect every single Christian. So I want you to notice, first of all, that we have some unhappy Christians. I'm sorry, not here, but in, in Scripture. <laughs> It does happen to a lot of Christians, doesn't it? I want you to notice, beginning in verse number one, we'll read uh, these first four verses to, uh, as I read them. Follow along in your Bible, please. Acts chapter six. And in those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, that means the church was growing. That means people were following Jesus Christ. That means good things were happening. Anytime God works, it's a good thing. Anytime God works, it is a good thing. Disciples were multiplied. These were not fakes. All right, these were not hypocrites. These were genuine followers of Jesus Christ. All right, the apostles were witnessing. God was working. And there were people, men and women and boys and girls, following Jesus Christ and claiming to be a disciple of Jesus. This is important. They were putting themselves under the direction of God, saying, God, I want to be like you. Jesus, I want to follow your teachings. I want to do what you tell me to do. This is good. This is not just someone praying a simple prayer. This is now following by faith the, the words and the instructions of God. I'm a disciple. And God calls all of us to be disciples. And disciples were being multiplied. You, you see that in Scripture? Not just, at other times, there are people added to the church, but here they're multiplied. Notice the, the unique uh, the addition here, that multiplication, that this was a movement. You could look around and, and not just one or two. We already heard about once five and once 8,000 converts in one sitting, but now disciples being multiplied and, and people rising up. I want to follow, I want to follow, I want to follow, I want to follow. What an exciting time. The disciples were being multiplied, and they were following Jesus Christ. But notice the next phrase, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. There were some who would murmur. Because there 
widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And I want you to understand something here, that there was a legitimate need. The daily administration would have been, uh, if you remember back in the previous chapters, where they were selling things and, and they were then taking care of some needs. And this group of Grecians, those who had a different uh, upbringing, a different background than the Hebrews, they would have been perhaps Jewish in nature but not born in Jerusalem. Or they were Grecians. Uh, they noticed that, that their widows, those who lost a spouse, were apparently not receiving the same uh, help that some of the Hebrew widows were receiving. And it appears to be a legitimate need, a legitimate concern. That, 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 look, look they're, they're, these ladies were not getting the same thing that, that these ladies were. And they said, oh my goodness, this is a discrepancy. But how they handled it was not correct. And I almost left this out of the sermon because I want to get down to what God did with Stephen, but I think it's worth mentioning for a few moments because the Bible mentions it. The Bible says they begin to murmur. And that word murmur is not a positive biblical word. In fact, if you go through Scripture, in the Old Testament, you'll see the word murmur. It's in the Hebrew, so it's a different word, but it's the same idea, complaining. You'll find this word in the New Testament. In fact, the Bible will say later on in Philippians, do all things without murmurings and disputings. This word murmuring is not a good word. And so though there was a legitimate need, there was an illegitimate complaining going on. Now, none of us in here or online would ever be guilty of complaining, would we? We, we would never have cause or reason to complain, much less let that flesh and that carnality and that sinful behavior actually rear its ugly head in our life, now would we? This word murmur has the idea of a secret debate. And I can picture what happened because it happens in churches and it happens in families and it happens in the workplace that one guy, one girl, find something perhaps legitimate, right? And this was a legitimate concern because they're going to deal with it. And this guy or this girl says, hey, hey, you see what they're doing over there? And they have a secret debate. They have a secret judgment. It's secret not between them, but because the person having the problem doesn't know about it. And this idea of murmurings is like, can you believe that? Can you believe the apostles? would not treat our widows the same way? Can you believe that? No, I can't believe that. I always thought Peter was one of those guys. I mean, who am I to say? But, but I mean, look at it. Look, I mean, look, yesterday they went, they went to see Ruth over there, but they didn't go to see uh, Lucia over there. I mean, you, 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 I, I'm just saying. Murmurings. Does it happen at church? Sure does. Sure does. Never a good thing. Never a good thing. This began with some unhappy Christians. Legitimate needs, illegitimate complaining. What's interesting, the Bible in this passage does, just kind of like looks over that. Now, don't mistake that, that it's okay. You understand that the Bible can't put every conversation and every reaction to every situation down? All right, so you can't look and say, look at that, they fixed it, so obviously it's okay to murmur and complain. It's not. Just read the Old Testament. When people murmured and complained, they died. I've often thought that if God did that again, there'd be no one at church. There'd be no families. There'd be no teenagers. I would be dead, and so would you. All right, let, well, let's be transparent and honest here. Like, if God still killed, one time they're complaining, and he sends snakes. All the time they're complaining about leadership of Moses and he opens the earth. Listen, you would think that would stop complaining, but it doesn't. People still find a reason to murmur and complain. And so I don't want to, the message is not about this, but I just want to warn you this morning. All right, God is not honored when we murmur and complain. He's not honored in a family when kids murmur and complain against mom and dad. And that happens in families. Kids have a secret tribal council about the reaction and actions of parents. It happens between men about their wives. 
It happens about wives, about their husbands. It happens about teachers against their students, and students against their teachers. It happens uh, in churches. It happens. And God is not honored with murmuring. He's not. God cannot use murmuring. But that's not my message today. But if it fits, then stop by the power of God. But it began with some unhappy Christians. Look, please, in, in verse number two, though. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I love the fact that when the apostles heard of this, eventually they were made aware of, of, the, of this problem, of the murmuring. They called the disciples together, all the disciples, a multitude of the disciples whom were complaining about the problem. Right? These complaints were not coming from the unsaved or those who were just saved, but from the disciples. Right? Those who had chosen to follow. He called them all together. They called them together and said, listen, here's the solution. We're not going to solve this problem. You notice that? We're not going to minister both directions. We can't. It's too big for us. But we are going to give you the solution. And I said, we want you to find seven men. And the Bible then gives three characteristics. I want you to notice the underlying characteristics here. They're found in verse number three. Seven men full of honest report, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. I want you to notice that there are three characteristics that these apostles said, you look for these three things among the disciples. Number one, an honest report or a good testimony. You know that a good testimony pleases God? That's what an honest report means. And he said, look, look around among yourselves. Look around among the other disciples and find someone with a good testimony testimony. Do you understand that you have a testimony? You have a testimony among the unsaved who don't know maybe you're a Christian and you have a testimony among the saved. You have a testimony at church. People know where, you're, where you sit. They know if you sing. They know if you smile. They often know if, if you have an honest report and the apostles have instructed here, look for those who have a good testimony. I don't live my life for others, but I live in front of others. And so do you. And we can't claim, well, that doesn't matter because right here it really matters. And Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. But I can't hide my testimony. I shouldn't try to hide it. I should try to be someone who has an honest report, a good testimony, and so should you. Students at school, you should have an honest report among your teachers. Your teachers should think that's a young man, that's a young lady who has a good, who has a good work ethic, who has a good attitude, who applies themselves. Can I get an amen out there? Adults? Amen. amen. Good. Yell at the students. Now adults, you should have a good testimony at work. Honest, trustworthy, dependable. Can I get an amen, young people? Amen. There we go. <laughs> that's Christians. In every walk of life, these characteristics ought to be those we strive for. Not fake, not to put on, but I want an honest report, a good testimony. Number two, they were looking for those who were full of the Holy Ghost. Well, pastor, I thought that once you're saved, you receive the Holy Ghost. You're exactly right. It was assumed in this passage that these people were saved. What was not assumed was that when it says full of the Holy Ghost, it means those that were controlled fully by the Holy Ghost. It wasn't looking for those who were just saved. That's understood. It was looking for those who were fully surrendered to the Holy Ghost, doing everything that God asked of them to do. And look here. He was saying, the apostle said, look for those who you can see it in, meaning that when someone is surrendered to God, it is evident. 
well, I just live to myself and no one's going to see what I do. I'm sorry, my friends. That's not what the Bible's looking for. It's not looking for fake Pharisees, looking for genuine Christians who say, God, I want to follow you and I'm not afraid to show everyone else that I'm following you. Not for my benefit. You know, end of every service, we have an invitation up here. Other churches do it differently. We've had an invitation here coming forward for as long as I've been here. And probably as long as Pastor Lett was here, so I'd say we're going on about 50 years. Now, you can get right with God in your seats. Absolutely, you can. All right, you can. And you ought to. But you ought to sometimes spend some time with God where it's evident. You say, well, Pastor, that seems pharisaical. It reminds you of a, little, of a young man by the name of Daniel who prayed out the window not once, not twice, but three times a day. That it's such a testimony, all right, such a testimony that the other people who were against him said, we're going to use himself against him because we know he prays. And Daniel was not praying to show who he was. Daniel was praying to, sh to show who God was and whom servant he was. You see, when the Holy Ghost, when you're full of the Holy Ghost and it's full of you, it's got you, it'll be evident to other people. They'll be able to tell whether you're a fake and a fraud, and we've all seen those, have we not? We've seen someone who has prayed, and you're like, oh, brother, I don't think they're praying to God. They're praying for us. We can tell. And you and I both can tell when you interact with someone and they are full of the Holy Ghost. When God has them and they're surrendered to him, you walk away, you're encouraged. You walk away, your spirit's uplifted. You're like, man, that person's not putting on. But don't hide it. Don't hide it. They were supposed to be an uh, honest report and, and be full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. Wisdom in the Bible is always connected to right actions. It's not just being smart. So what they're looking for is seven men who live like a Christian. You really could say they said the same thing three times. Honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom is really just living for God. And it was evident to these people. And so the disciples began to look around. Hmm, we've got to find some really touched men. Now I would submit here that God's looking from the, for this from every Christian. They look around. They're like, hmm. And you know what? I'm sure there are some people that they, names were mentioned and someone else said, no, not them. Not him. No, 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 not him. Because they've asked us to find people who have a good testimony. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, but, but that person, I don't, I don't know that they're really genuine. What about this person? Oh. What about Stephen? Oh. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah? You know what? You had a good one there, Stephen. And the Bible says that, that then from this list that seven men were chosen. Please look in your scripture. All right, in verse number five, in the same, please the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now, I'm going to real quick tie this thing to for you because what happens next is absolutely amazing. All right, so far, I'm already challenged and encouraged. Quit murmuring, quit complaining, and live a life that will please God in front of others. We can stop right there, give an invitation, and, and we all ought to ought to respond. But what caught my attention studying this passage is what happens next. Because remember the problem? The problem was what? With, with, with what? The widows. All right, so what we should read next is that then Stephen begins to serve the widows. Should we not? They chose these men. There were some murmurings. They got people to meet the needs of widows. And so what should happen next in Scripture is Stephen is going house to house, ministering to the widows. That's what we should read, but that's not what we read. That is not what we read, because I want you to notice real quick this morning the unique calling. 
Notice here uh, in verse number 7, and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. So more disciples following God and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, verse number 8, full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Sicilia and Asia disputing with Stephen. And verse number 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suburned men which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to him to counsel and set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. There are three verses in this next portion of Scripture I'm going to point out to us and show what God will do. But understand the problem began with some complaining about some widows. The call was out for some faithful men of good testimony who are surrendered to God. And yet God takes this, this man, Stephen, and he does something that is so much greater than meeting the needs of the widows. Though that was a need. God begins to use Stephen, a man who is completely sold out, a man who is completely surrendered to accomplish a divine purpose. And the purpose was so much bigger than dropping a meal off at a widow's house. This purpose will result in him giving his life for Jesus Christ. This purpose will result in men and women and boys and girls following God you see, in our life, there are surface winds and there are currents. And when we're anchored to God, the surface winds may blow, but it cannot move us because the current of God will carry us where we ought to go. And Stephen was a man who was deep with God. And so as the surface winds of the accusations came, Stephen was not blown over. He was not blown away. He was connected to the current of God and his power. You see what happens here, that Stephen was noticed by others because of his character, but he was used by God because of his surrender. He was noticed by others because of character, but used by God because of his surrender. In fact, in verse number five, he was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. My friends, I promise you today that if you are filled with faith of God and let the Holy Spirit control you full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, that God will use you. I know he will. He wants to, but he wants those who are surrendered and completely surrendered to him. He takes the unlikely and makes them likely. He takes a young shepherd boy who was forgotten by his father and his brothers and raises him up as the king and now throughout Scripture, David, King David, the lowly shepherd boy, is now forever exalted as the king of Israel. He takes a young girl, Mary, who those thought she had been improper with her fiancé, and raises her up. And now forever we know of Mary and her faithfulness to God, full of faith and the Holy Ghost. God uses those who are surrendered to him. I want to give you three thoughts about that. Number one, God speaks. <clears throat> God speaks through those who are completely surrendered to him. Look, please, in verse number 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. This is a biblical truth. You're sold out to Jesus Christ that God will speak through you. God will speak through you. You will find situations, you'll find circumstances that are inexplicable. Others cannot argue with the wisdom of God that God will speak through those who are completely surrendered to him. And it may sound the same, but when God does it, my friends, I promise you that it will move mountains. There was a camp, summer camp. Young boy was there. He had uh, what is called a, a form of paralysis. Spastic paralysis. It caused his speech to be very halted. And when he would 
thought it would be difficult. As you can imagine, the other young people can't begin to ridicule this young boy. True story. They ridicule him. They make fun of him. They purposely ask him questions so that he would have to answer. Of course, I say that most of our spirit rises up at those other boys, right? We don't know who they are, but we can knock them out. <laughs> well, we decided to, to play a big practical joke on him, and so they <clears throat> lined him up at this camp, Christian camp, to give a testimony the last day. It was their last cruel joke on this boy. And now, most of us would be very <laughs> incensed, would we not? Like, where were the adults at this camp? I don't know. I know the story. Apparently, he got up unashamed the last day. And he simply said this, his own halted speech. Jesus loves me, and I love Jesus. He went to his seat and sat down. They said what happened next was truly unbelievable. With those simple words and the shortest testimony known to any Christian camp, that revival touched. And boys and girls began to fall on their knees, get right with God. Now, all of us could make a statement like that. But God speaks through those who are completely sold out to him. When God speaks through us, amazing things happen. They say there are still men and women who are in the ministry today because of that boy's testimony. That's what God does. And Stephen was a man sold out to God, and God spoke through him to these, to, to these religious leaders who could not resist the wisdom by which he spake. Why? Because God was speaking through him. And he'll speak through you. And maybe at your work, your boss needs to see a man or a woman who's sold out to Jesus Christ. And that'll be the cause that'll cause your place of work to be touched by the gospel. In your home, your neighborhood, God is looking for men and women who are sold out to him. And he'll speak through those who are completely surrendered to him. Amen. I read this as well in this passage. Look, please, that not only does he speak through those that God has seen through those who are completely sold out to him. Verse number 15. And all they, and all that sat in the council looking steadfastly among him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. You see, God has seen and he speaks through those who are completely sold out to him. When they looked at that council, they saw not Stephen. They didn't see his character. They didn't see his honest report. They did not see, they saw God. You know what I want in my life? For God to be seen. You know what you ought to desire in your life today? For God to be seen. You know where God will be seen? Through the lives of men and women and boys and girls, rich, poor, smart, not smart, talented, it doesn't matter, common or unique, that God will be seen through those who are completely surrendered to him. Amen. And number three, God uses those who are completely surrendered to him. It's found in verse number, five, in verse number eight. And Stephen full of faith and power. <laughs> and this is what I love. This next phrase, you can read it, has nothing to do with the widows, has nothing to do with service. It has to do with God. And Stephen, who was full of faith and of power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. You know where you find the power of God? In surrender. You say, well, I, I wish I could have that cool story. Well, surrender. Surrender. I wish I could have that amazing experience where God could use me. Then surrender. And completely surrender. In whatever calling, whatever place God has placed you. And for Stephen, all he knew was now time to serve some widows. And God knew that that was merely another step in his grand story. 
And God takes a man who was observed by his fellow believers to have a good testimony, to have complete surrender to the Holy Ghost and have wisdom in his life and actions. And God takes this man, Stephen, and turns his life upside down. Because he was something great? No. Because he was so unique? No. Because he was surrendered. There's once a man who was employed at a small store. <clears throat> His job was to stock shelves and sweep the floors. But he rarely did either. What he would do is just stand around and talk to all the patrons and chat with customers. One day, a frequent customer came in and noticed that the man who usually would chat wasn't there. She said to the owner of the, of the small store, well, I noticed that Bob's not here. No, no, he retired. She said, oh, are you going to replace him? The owner said, no, I'm not. He didn't do much anyway. And I wonder, Christian, if that would be our story as a Christian. Because we're called to follow God. We're called to be surrendered. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your, which is my, which is our reasonable service. We're called, if I can, to sweep the floor and stock the shelves. Yet I wonder if, instead of being surrendered, we become consumed with self. And we do what we want to do. Show up on a Sunday, it's great. I'm glad you're here. Without any purpose. God wants to use those who are surrendered to him. He was noticed by others because of his character. He was used by God because of surrender. You know what surrender says? Surrender says anything, anytime, anywhere, any cost. And so this morning, our challenge is simple. Let's be surrendered to God. If you're not, then surrender today. If you've allowed your own devices, your own thoughts, your own goals and purpose to fulfill your life, then set that aside and say, God, I want to be your disciple, completely surrendered to you so that anything you ask, I will do. Any place you call, I will go. Any cost you ask, I will pay. And say, God, you use me. Because God is looking for those Christians who will be completely surrendered to him. Stephen, what a story. And the best is yet to come. Music